Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of uh, Symphony 101. Uh, this is my final video, and it'll represent the wrapping up of our online uh, presence over the last number of weeks and months, um, since we have had to stop our operations in the Portsmouth Symphony Orchestra. Um, it's been a very challenging time for all of us, and for you, um, we've done our best to try and keep things going and in a robust way, and things that are entertaining. Um, and we've now reached a new phase, as <clears throat> uh, states are about to start opening up and uh, dealing with the next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this seems like a fitting point for us to sign off on this part of our season, which would really represent the end of our season. Um, and as I'm preparing for this, I'm reminded of a few things, but uh, the inspiration for today really is the idea of beginnings and ends. Um, how do composers make those choices? How does a composer decide how to start a piece and how to end a piece? Um, an inspirational quote comes to mind. Uh, today being uh, representing the liberation of Europe 75 years ago. Um, I'm reminded of a quote by Churchill who said that now this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And I think that kind of sums up where we are in my mind uh, at the moment. We have been through the initial shock of um, the pandemic, and we're now trying to deal with ways in which we can make sense of it and try to responsibly move forward and get back to a sense of normality. Um, but there's an awful lot of work, obviously, ahead, and a lot of challenges ahead for us as an orchestra and for me as a conductor. I have four orchestras that I look after every week, um, normally. Um, all of those came to a stop abruptly in the middle of March. And we're planning for the fall, and all of us are thinking um, creatively about how we can make the return sensibly, responsibly, safely, but try to make a return into some sense of what an orchestra means and what performance means for us. Um, so the end of the beginning seems fitting right now. Um, for our season next year, we have planned great things. We're, we have our first concert at the end of October is planned out uh, as a, a kind of Halloween um, theme. Also, we're trying to uh, involve or incorporate uh, some of the great works of art. Uh, Beethoven 5 is on my mind. Um, heading towards the second part of the year, uh, Brahms 1 we looked at in this series, that's also very much on my mind. Um, the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto, uh, which we have never done in the Portsmouth Symphony, uh, is also a great, great piece that audiences adore, and that's on my mind. So we have lots of um, uh, I have lots of exciting ideas, and we're now trying to figure out how to make those actually work. Uh, but please stay tuned. Know that we're, we're coming back as soon as we can get on the stage. We safely and responsibly, we will be back. There's no doubt about that. So please continue to watch for us and support us uh, as we go through this difficult time along with everybody else. So... I'm here to talk about music um, and the idea of beginnings and ends, of course, beginning and middle and end um, is an age old uh, structure for telling stories. Uh, writers, all creative artists are engaged in the idea of structuring their, their works, making things coherent while at the same time making them original. That's the creative dilemma. How do you make something intelligible but also make it really interesting and new and fresh? Um, and those expectations on how you link those, those two things together. Uh, 
the Aristotle idea of beginning, middle, and end is something we have, you know, predates Aristotle. It's, it's probably what we would call life. Um, and composers were, of course, right in the middle of that. How do you uh, structure a piece? We've talked a little bit about the idea of sonata form in symphonies, uh, where you have an exposition, then you have a development section, and you have a recapitulation. It very neatly fits into that idea of beginning, middle, and end. Uh, dramatically, the beginning, of course, would be where you set up a problem. You know, you stick your hero up a tree. And then the development section is where you work through the problem, um, where we maybe throw stones at our hero up the tree. And then the recapitulation is where we try and resolve the, the musical tensions, the musical uh, issues in a recapitulation. And that's dramatically where maybe our hero gets back down out of the tree. So um, it's a very simplistic notion, but it's also very strong and very powerful. So how did composers deal with those things? I could spend a lot of time talking about maybe just one piece and how that works. What I thought I would do though is, is take a snapshot of a few pieces and show you some of the choices that composers made uh, regarding beginnings and endings. Some of these are symphonies, one of them is not, but how, what choices did, did a composer make to begin a piece and how did they choose to end it? Um, and it's not a comprehensive analysis, it's a snapshot, it's a kind of quantitative uh, just snapshot of what of what these composers uh, were were looking for or looking to do, um, but I thought it might be interesting just to look at those some of those those choices that were made. Um, and the first piece I want to look at is uh, a piece we we looked at very briefly, but I want to come back to is the Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Six, the Pathetique, which was written in eighteen ninety three, right at the end of the nineteenth century. Extremely romantic piece very um, charged, passionate piece. Um, and how did Tchaikovsky uh, make those choices? How did he begin his piece and how did he end it? You know, and very simply, you can begin a piece strongly, you can begin a piece quietly, you can set up things um, in different ways. You can end a piece strongly, you can end it with a big fanfare, um, or you can end quietly. And these are choices that composers have to come have to make. So the first piece we're going to look at is this Tchaikovsky Symphony, and I have it right here, uh, which we've looked at a little bit before. I hope you can see that. Let's see if I can make it better. Yeah, okay. There we go. So what you find, and we looked at the score before, these are, this is the outline of the score. Uh, we have our winds up at the top. We've got our flutes, our oboes, clarinets, bassoons, horns here. The horns at F. These horns are in F, so we have to read it as if it's a fifth uh, from the concert page C. Uh, trumpets in B flat. I should point out the clarinets here are in A. They're not in B flat this time, they're in A. That's a choice due to the, the uh, key that Tchaikovsky's writing in. Um, trumpets in B flat. Here are our uh, trombones. That's our tuba timpani. And here are strings all at the bottom. First, second violins divided into two, as we've seen before. Violas, who are actually divided, divisi. Uh, and then we have the cello line, and then we actually have contrabassi at the bottom, our basses, and they're divided as well. So this is this unusual texture at the beginning, and his marking at the top, if you can see, adagio. This is slow. This is a slow, ponderous beginning. Um, you can tell from what the bassoon is trying to do, bassoon line here, this is the melody. And it's constantly trying to, to creep up and fall down. So it's, 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 it's urging upwards and then it falls and it stops here. And underneath it you have the basses and this viola line, this dark, dark, dark textures um, supporting all of that. So, I'm going to play the opening, a video of it, 
hopefully you can hear it and you can hear this the choices that that Tchaikovsky made this opening dark from really from the uh, bowels of the earth just opening up um, it's it's an amazing amazing and very charged opening so here it is It's very quiet. And that recording is very quiet. You may not have been able to hear it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to play this on the keyboard. So this is the beginning of Tchaikovsky 6. So it's dark, deep, questioning, um, it's troubled. There's no doubt about it, you're setting up a very tragic, pathetic premise. Um, now obviously Tchaikovsky 4 is in, or 6 is in 4 movements, so he works through a lot of different emotions, a lot of different moods, characters. Um, but how he chooses to end the piece, I think, is also in this case very telling and ties directly to what Tchaikovsky was trying to say. He could have ended a symphony loudly, which most composers choose to do. Um, he chose to end it in a resigned way, in a way where it was, it felt like it was the end. Um, and this is what it looks like at the very, very end, the final final page of the, of the piece and you can see that there are lots of different um, it, it dissolves it just kind of falls away but towards the end here this is the this is this these final four uh, staves are the end of the piece you have the shadows divided and then you have the bases also divided so he goes back to this really dark deep subterranean world at the end and just these little pizzicatos you see these little things here boom boom in the bass and this rhythm this ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba, like heartbeat fading and that's what he's trying to convey and that's how he ends his piece um and i shall play it i shall play a version of it i hope you can hear it um but this is uh, well, this is a different version of the piece. Hang on. I can open this up. Ah, okay. So this is the end of Tchaikovsky 6.
and you'll hear the way that it dissolves with everything falling down. All the lines are heavy and falling. One of the greatest pieces. There's so much more to it, and it's very hard to describe all of that in a very short space of time. That's just a very simple, simplistic snapshot of the beginning and the end of the piece. Um, but he chose to end in that resigned, quiet, draining away um, of energy. Um, it's incredibly effective, incredibly sad. Um, that's what he was obviously going for. So that's the choice that he made, that was his beginning and that was his end. And the middle is full of all sorts of wonderful stuff. Please go listen to it. Tchaikovsky 6 is one of the, one of the greatest pieces. Um, but that's just a glimpse of what of the choices that he made at the start and the end of the piece. Um, and I'm going to move on now to a completely different work, also Russian. Tchaikovsky was Russian. This is another piece by another Russian composer, um, talking about beginnings and ends. I'm talking about uh, expectations, intelligibility, originality, or that conversation. Um, this is the Rite of Spring. This is by Igor Stravinsky. It was It's a ballet. It was written in 1913. And when it was written, it was shocking. It was so shockingly original. Um, it took everyone kind of by surprise and there was essentially a riot broke out in the first performance in 1913. Um, and it's because he took off in a completely different way from what people had expected. He broke a lot of the paradigms. He broke a lot to he twisted people's expectations and he created this incredible, incredible work of art. It's still considered modern in 2020. It's still considered a modern piece. And uh, that goes to the heart, of course, of what modernity is, which is an attitude rather than a time period. Um, but this, this is the, the incredible rite of spring. And I'm just going to look at the very opening and the very end. Um, this is not a symphony. It does not follow the four movement pattern. It is structured into two pieces. The opening is the adoration of the earth, and the second one is called the sacrifice. Uh, it's just two, two pieces, two sections. Um, but it is a ballet, so it's telling obviously uh, some kind of story, um, and that is kind of spelled out through the piece. Uh, but he, well, let's have a little look at it, and I'll try and explain some of the originality that, that that's going on in the Rite of Spring. Um, but first of all, the first thing we should look at is just the orchestra, what is being used here. Um, 
and here is a list of the orchestra. If you can see it. Yeah, right. So it's got a whole raft of instruments. Piccolo, three flutes, alto flute, four oboes, corongli, clarinet and D, this is the piccolo clarinet, three clarinets and uh, bass clarinet, four bassoons, a double bassoon, contra bassoon, eight horns, a trumpet and D, plus four other trumpets, three trombones, two tubas, two timpani, a percussion section, which is enormous, and then strings. So it's essentially using everything and a kitchen sink in this piece. Um, and how does he choose to begin? You've got all of that, right? And how does he choose to get begin? Well, this is it. That's the very beginning. You'll see what this is here, right here. So you've got um, one instrument. It's one instrument, one line. It's a bassoon, a solo bassoon, right here, playing extremely high in its register, and it's completely alone in the first bar. It's joined in the second bar by a horn as an accompaniment, but it's Essentially, the entire first bar is just bassoon. It's a single line. And you have to remember that Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky were influenced by um, folk music of, of, of Russia. And here is Stravinsky's, this is Stravinsky's version of a folk tune. Now, it doesn't sound at all like a folk tune. At all. Okay, it sounds like this. It's like really tight in the throat and that's what he's trying to get across and can you imagine being that bassoon player trying to play that piece for the first time uh, or any time <laughs> after that you are you start it and it's the it, it doesn't give a dynamic but it's usually starts very quietly and just comes in it's got this really tight throaty sound and that's how he starts this piece um, single line um, there's lots of other things in the route of spring that we can talk about but that, I just want to talk about beginnings and ends, and that's his beginning. Um, the other thing you will notice here is that the every single bar, right? Every single bar here has got a different, remember what this is called? Time signature. It all has a different meter. So the first is four. So you got four quarter notes playing the first bar. The third, the, the second bar is three, and then back to a four. And then do a two. And this is a theme that runs through the Rive Spring. He's constantly changing with meter. Um, and I'll play the very opening and you can hear this. You can hear what he's trying to do here. Um, it's kind of shocking. But imagine that this is the orchestra, fully with this massive orchestra. And this is what you hear. Wow, it's kind of scary for that bassoon player. Um, I hope you heard that. It's got that. There's a certain folk element to it, but it's it's so different and it's so shocking. Um, that's how he chooses to begin the piece. Um, but I think everyone who knows the Rite of Spring, Rite of Spring, um, knows that the ending is actually probably the most shocking part of the entire piece. All of it through, we can talk about all sorts of parts of it that are very, very shocking and rude, but the, the, the end is the sacrificial dance. And it's where the uh, principal dancer 
literally dances herself to death. Um, but it's all about, and I'll just show you one of these, and we'll just look through the, the string line here. It's all about this. 516, 28, 18, 28, 516, 28, 516, 28. Every single bar has got a different meter. And these are on, this is not, this is, um, 516s are mixed meter. So you've got ba 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 ba, one, two, one, two, three, within the bar. So it's rhythmically very challenging. And for 1913, this 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 was kind of radical. Not kind of. This was this was just completely new, and it shocked a lot of people. Um, and he chose to end. Obviously, this is a shocking piece in a very shocking way, uh, which was you know, Stravinsky really nailing his idea to the end. Um, and let's see if we can if I can bring it up. We can actually hear the end of this. And it is, it's still shocking. Over a uh, over hundred years later, it still shocks. And it's still very, very hard as well. Rhythmically driven, all the way to the end, um, with all of this mixed meter constantly changing between time signatures. Incredibly complex piece, really complex. That was his choice, it was, was to drive this modernism, this modernist train, this, this, this um, obsession with um, originality. And he offended a lot of people. <laughs> you didn't expect this to happen, um, but it was... In, it was a consistent uh, choice through the piece. And I would like to end, and I know I've gone on a little longer than I normally do, but I just wanted to end this on another note and another composer, a composer that's very, very close to me. Um, choices made by um, another symphonist, Gustav Mahler. And I just want to talk briefly about the beginning and the end of his symphony number one which was also an original piece, but in a different way, a different way from, from, from Stravinsky. So, Mahler's first symphony begins, the choice that he makes is he begins, and this is a really difficult, I suppose, to see and understand, but look at the string section here, the way that they're divided. This is the first and second violins, and they are playing way, way up in the top of their, not just the top of their register, they're actually playing what are known as harmonics, where you just touch the string and you get this glassy uh, sound, which is even higher than the pitch of the note that you're playing, usually an octave. Um, so incredibly high note here, right here. That's what all that means, flageolet. 
and see how high that is up in the leisure lines. You've got second violins doing the same, you've got the viola, everyone's everyone's playing these. And then the bass at the bottom is actually playing a real note, so this uh, right there. But everyone's divided, the whole texture. Huge orchestra again. As big as the Rite of Spring. But comparable. Um, a few things here and there. But his opening has got this, just this, this cascade, and it's all the same note. And in fact, if you played all of the A's on a piano, you would get this opening. Every single one of them together. So you've got this. Right? Seven octaves of A's. Uh, all together at the very opening. And he's creating just this scene. He's setting a scene. And he's setting a scene of, and this is the German, nature sound. Nature light. Nature. Mahler was obsessed by nature. And inspired by nature. And he always wanted to represent nature and recreate nature in his works. And here he does this at the very opening with this opening set of A's. Just so open, pristine. And then what happens is we've got instruments that come in playing four very simple intervals, right? And after we do that, they answer each other. You get fanfares. Lots of fanfare things that happen throughout the whole thing. Little fanfares coming from way in the distance. So Mahler was trying to create a, a real world, uh, or a, a, a representation of the real world in, uh, his, in his opening, um, and world of nature. Um, and it's such a gloriously beautiful and pristine opening. In fact, this piece, the reason I wanted to end with this piece is because it's actually, for me, the happiest piece of music I know, Mahler's first symphony. Uh, again, it's got uh, four full movements. It used to have five, but it's, it's, uh, it got uh, revised. Four movements. Um, the revised version was first performed in the same year as the Tchaikovsky Six, which is uh, 1893. Um, and it is original, but it's not original in, a, in the modernist way that, that Stravinsky is going. He's doing something else, um, using nature, something we're all very familiar with. Um, and going back, of course, to traditions of Berlioz and Beethoven representing nature in their music. Um, but this is quite, quite incredible the way he does this, and I hope you can hear this opening. If I can find it... Here it is. So the opening A's, the spanning of the universe, it's eternal, it has no beginning, it has no end, just always there. Then these fourths, like bird, bird song, bird calls, and then the, the fanfares and the clowners, lots of these things that come from outside of music, that we normally think of music, to create this, paint this landscape create this program, program music, um, which is something I haven't really talked about, but the idea of actually trying to create, represent something from the world in music, uh, programmatic. Um, so that's how he chooses to open it, this really open, open, open world, open space, full of possibility. Um, and 
how he chooses to end it. Of course, you can end soft, you can end loud. Mahler did both in his lifetime. Uh, the Ninth Symphony ends very quietly, very much like the Tchaikovsky Sixth, uh, which the, those two pieces are kind of related. But how he ends the end of this symphony is just fun, glorious, unashamed, D major, happy. And it's big and it's loud. And he makes that those choices. Um, I think some people possibly think of it as, as naive, but for me it's just such a gloriously happy place to to end. It's kind of like the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, you know, like the piece that never had an ending and just kept going on and on and on. But we don't feel it as being trite, we feel it as being consistent with the piece. Well, I feel the same way about, about the end of this piece. Um, and it's got lots of these, you see all these da 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 This is all the brass and the winds and they're all just like whipping, woo, whip it up, put it up, put it up, and we hear fanfares. So I just want to, uh, I'll end with this and um, we'll have a little, just a little view of the end of Mahler's first symphony. Leonard Bernstein with the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra playing the end of Mahler's first symphony. Um, I hope you can hear all the ba 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 ba. Those are those fourths and which we heard from the beginning, from the opening, now transformed into the end. All the fanfares, all the whipping. Um, it's such a glorious ending. And again, a choice that Mahler made to end in that way, to send us off into the world, believing that that is the case. Uh, so beginnings, and endings. Um, we could say so much more, but um, at this point I'm going to sign off on Symphony 101 for now. We're hoping to restart an online presence in the fall, even though we're going ahead with our season, which we of course we hope we do uh, in some way or another. Um, so please stay in touch with us, watch out for us, we will be sending notification to you guys. Please support us, please consider donating to us to help us through this. Um, we hope we've been here for you guys for the last few months um, and like I said, let's hope this is the end of the beginning 
and that there is a uh, light ahead and that we will make progress and we will make our way back to uh, back to our lives as we imagined them, as we want them to be. So I wish you all the very best. I hope you stay healthy and happy and safe. Please look after each other and please do come back and see us in the fall uh, at the Portsmouth Symphony. Thank you so much.